having a good time? Oh, yeah. Anybody learn anything yet? Yeah. We're well, about to learn a lot. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Colbert. I'm with the uh, Harvard Innovation Labs, and I get to moderate this august panel. Um, one, of the, one of the sort of contexts of this, if you will, is this idea of experiential learning, and it's something that we subscribe to here uh, at the Harvard Innovation Labs. Realizing that the sort of monadic, you know, one-way thing isn't isn't so effective anymore, and, and you know, surrounding the student is is key, and um, and obviously technology is enabling all this to to happen at scale, as they say. Um, very few people uh, have as much experience as these two gentlemen to my right, uh, my left, in the, in this topic, uh, Chris Didi. Uh, Timothy E. This is this is a long this is a, a long bio. Here we go. No, do the short one. Do the short one. He's brilliant. He's quite brilliant and quite lovely and really knows what he's talking about. Perfect. Perfect. And he has a number of research things and all sorts of stuff. With to his left is Andre. Is it Homala? Hom yeah, it is. Homala. Um, Andre is the co-founder of Lifelike, a visual learning tool that leverages both AR and VR to bring unique experiences to the classroom was recently selected as HTC Vive's strategic partner for education. Congratulations. So welcome to you both, and, and thank you for doing this. Um, Chris, I think you're going to sort of kick us off with a few context setting slides, maybe? Right. Yeah, let's do it. So I've, um, is this working at all? Can you? Yes, good. OK. I've been uh, working with learning technologies for more than 40 years. And if you take nothing else away today, realize that the technology is never the innovation. The technology is a catalyst. And if it leads to deeper content, more active forms of learning, more authentic forms of assessment, links between school and life, then it's going to be powerful. But if it's just, let's put iPads in classrooms, magic's going to happen, you stand near them, knowledge and learning is going to radiate into people's minds, <laughs> not so much. And in fact, too much emphasis is often put on the novelty factor. Google Cardboard goes into classrooms. Kids get these wonderful gee whiz expressions on their faces. I can tell you a year later, when it's commonplace and entertainment, kids are going to see it as chocolate covered broccoli. So it's very important to look at what the experience is rather than what the medium is. And for immersive media, that experience is what's called situated learning. So if you've ever had an internship, you've experienced situated learning. You're going to a place that's unfamiliar. You're part of a culture that's different. You watch people wearing shoes that you're not familiar with, going through practices together that are strange to you. And you immerse yourself in that, and it becomes a very powerful learning experience. And that's really the heart of what's valuable in immersive media for learning. Uh, you're engaged by the experience initially, but ultimately it becomes familiar and you develop an identity in it. It evokes a rich range of knowledge and skills from you that give you the chance to practice authentic performances in life rather than artificial academic performances. And at the back end, something that no one has talked about yet, these immersive media are collecting a constant stream of data, second by second, about what you're doing. And that can be very powerful for assessment and for improvement if that data is reflected back to you properly. The other kind of framing thing for education that I want to talk about is that there's a huge continuum now of immersive media. And at one end of the continuum, you've got fully immersive sensory virtual reality. At the other end of the continuum, we're adding a new colleague this spring at the Harvard Graduate School of Education who works in what are called tangible interfaces where you mix physical aspects of the interface with digital aspects of the interface. And there are a lot of variations in between. If you think about social media and somebody giving a talk about social media 10 years ago and describing two or three flavors of social media, Think of how many flavors there are now, and we're still inventing new kinds of social media. Think of it as like a toolbox with a wrench and a saw and a screwdriver and a hammer, and each tool is good for a particular kind of thing. We're still mapping what's in the toolbox and how each of these might be good. 
for a certain kind of learning, building on what the speakers in the last panel were saying. So my research team and I, uh, since 2008, have been exploring parts of that continuing using the principles that I described earlier. We've developed a virtual uh, series of virtual ecosystems. You're seeing two of them, a pond ecosystem and a forest ecosystem. Kids immerse themselves in middle school in that environment. You can be in a classroom in the middle of the winter, but psychologically you're at a pond or a forest in the middle of the summer. There's an ecological mystery going on and you're figuring out how to solve that mystery. And you're able to do a lot of authentic things that ecosystem scientists do. It is a little bit like a guided apprenticeship or a guided internship, and the medium provides the power to accomplish that. And it is important to recognize that on the one hand, you're learning a complicated skill, but on the other hand, you're getting a lot of help in doing that. It also tends to be interdisciplinary because real life problems are always interdisciplinary, and so that's an important theme within a learning. We've complemented that in recent years with EcoMobile, which is an augmented reality to complement our virtual environment. You have a mobile device like a smartphone or a tablet. You're in a real ecosystem. You're collecting real data. You're, uh, again, having an apprenticeship that builds on certain aspects of the real world. And the complement between the two is important. It's like a flight simulator versus flying a real airplane with an experienced co-pilot. You need both experiences to become really good at flying. So uh, we actually have four different kinds of immersive projects going on beyond the two that I've been able to describe, including a new one that's building in computational modeling for third graders. And there's just a lot of exciting work in education going on across the board, exploring the toolkit, trying to understand situated learning more deeply, and recognizing that it's never the medium, but it's always the message that's really important in education. Well put. Thank you very much. You want to talk a little bit about Lifelike and what you're doing with HTC? And Sure, absolutely. So uh, yeah, we, we believe that content is the king, and we, we believe that... Uh, you know, if you're born into the planet Earth from from minute one, uh, you are living in interactive three D environment, and uh, you know the the humankind was doing very interesting thing for the last ten thousand years, which was taking the this world and just projecting that into the paper with a lot of sophisticated techniques, and then just hoping that the rather the bright, brighter ones would get it, would understand those drawings that it means the building will. They'll be able to read the letters and just imagine what is behind the letters. And uh, that's how we've been uh, basically delivering the content for the last 10,000 years. And right now we have those amazing technologies into our hands where we can just make a shortcut. We can just bring this shit into the hands of people like it is. And that's what we are super excited to figure out how those technologies which are available out here today, how they can be used. And... Uh, We've been working for five years in the in the industry. Uh, myself, I have a little bit interesting background, but my, my co-founder, he was in, in 2K, which is one of the big gaming companies, and our colleagues been working on Grand Theft Auto and some other interesting IPs. So we know a little bit about how to make excite, ex exciting visual experience, but we have no idea what to do in education. So to make a long story short, we met uh, Steve Ballmer and uh, he was uh, trying to get developers for Windows 8 and uh, we started to talk to them and then to Anthony Salcito, VP of Education of Microsoft and we did something exciting for Windows 8. And thanks to that, we've been uh, exposed to teachers and they said, it's amazing what content can do, but this is completely useless for us because this is just gimmick, like give us tool. And uh, yeah, we, we spent some time truly figuring out what it is and uh, uh, if you want to see how life like looks like today, I invite you for for the demo, and you can see for yourself. Right, thank you. So going back to something you said, Chris, the the applications or the the value sets within the within immersive media, which of those engagement was one, and the capacity to measure was another, and I forget the one in the middle. But which which if there's sort of one central tenet to what this technology can do vis-a-vis -vis helping teach kids, students, whatever, like what would you, what would you, what flag would you plant in the ground on that? Well, first, I agree that, that there's a huge amount of human talent that's wasted because we're 
teaching people in ways that they don't learn. Um, people all sleep in pretty much the same way. Hotel rooms look largely alike, but people eat in very different ways. If you look at the range of menus and restaurants and the range of restaurants themselves, that's much wider. Well, learning is wider still than eating. And so we need ecosystems for learning where people can navigate to the niche that makes sense for them. And sometimes that niche is reading and dealing with symbols. But because we make that the only niche too often, we lose all this talent that now the medium can make accessible. So that's one central principle is to figure out how people learn and then have media <coughs> empower them in the ways that they learn to be effective. But I think the other piece of it is not summative assessment that tells you too late whether you succeeded or failed in learning something, but diagnostic assessment that's continuous, that's ongoing, that reflects back to you how you're doing um, minute by minute, day by day, so that you're constantly able to change what you're doing and improve. Because right now in education, we find out too late and too little. Whereas if you look at something like gaming in the entertainment world, people are constantly getting many kinds of feedback about how they're doing in the game and how to be better in the game. So the medium is quite capable of providing this. We just need to be smart enough to use it. So the you want to yeah so so, so we, we are in K twelve and uh, you know for, for us is really the teacher the, the gatekeeper for for the whole innovations there and uh, you know our our biggest our biggest thing right now is just to making sure that we can bring the good tool into the hands of teachers they can really use and uh, uh, they can easily adapt and this is you know surprisingly surprisingly enough a huge problem because. The threshold which you have to work as a technological company if you're trying to make it super simple for teachers to use it is way much lower if, than if you are thinking about the regular users. So making sure that we have a great tool for the teachers they can really use, which is really helping them with their work and which is helping them to connect with the students, which we learn is, is a really big problem for them. Because can you imagine that being teacher like now back into the school when the kids spend the whole Christmas trying to catch the Pokemons? Then bringing the you know the just you know uh, re regular teaching techniques and tools like you are ridiculous, right? If you like it or not. So the connection is becoming really important for them. And then what we also learn is that those inspirational teachers, those who do care about change, uh, for them it's one of the most important moment. It's like the moment when they are lighting the light light bulbs into the eyes of students. So. You know, reinforcing the learning passion in, in those students who are who are interested, that's that's what really matters for those teachers. So that's that's kind of like how we fit into the ecosystem and uh, you know, empowering the teachers, that's that's way to go. That's great. Do you do you guys see this as is additive or integrative? Meaning, you know, for some percentage of classrooms this is happening on the side, or do you see it as is, you know, ten X years from now is it's central to the to the K-12 classroom delivery system. You know, how do you, how do you see that? Well, first, I hope 10 years from now we have more life-wide learning where the classroom is one place that it happens, but not the only place that it happens. And I think that many of these media have the potential to enable that. I also think that um, one of the reasons for the achievement gap is that if you're doing well and you come from a privileged background, you get enrichment. And if you're coming from a background that hasn't been very privileged and you're struggling, you get remediation. And that's absolutely a recipe for widening the achievement gap. So the idea of using these media that can provide very rich experiences, often experiences that students coming out of poverty or coming out of various forms of discrimination have not had an opportunity to have in life, but can have initially as simulations, it opens up enrichment for all students in powerful ways, as long as the supports are there so that the experience <laughs> becomes meaningful. So that part could be integrative, but I think what can be additive that we're just starting to see in education is not just students as consumers, 
of immersive media, but students as creators of immersive <laughs> media. One of the most powerful ways that you can assess what somebody learns is to have them create something, to design something. And students augmenting their own backyard, students augmenting their own neighborhoods, students creating their own virtual realities to express what they're thinking and feeling. This is a very exciting frontier, and that would be more additive to what happens in schools, unfortunately, right now. Uh, so so uh, if we just look 10 years back, uh, the, the first iPhone was launched in, in 2006. And uh, look what happens on the hardware side in terms of innovation in the last 10 years. Uh, if, you, if you look on the content side, you know, the, the biggest innovation I see in the last 10 years is, is YouTube, which, which made uh, the wide, uh, you know, democratization of the online video. And then the Netflix, which bring the SaaS into the content. But that's it. I mean, that, that's what it is. So coming back to your question, I think there is a huge gap between what technology can do today and what content can do to, today. So uh, I believe that there is a huge opportunity for companies who will figure it out how to bring the, you know, sorry, lifelike content into not only in, into education, and that's that's the shift of the paradigm which which can happen in sooner than ten years. The only question is, you know, it, it's in end of the day also about the the, the core curriculum. So how how to really find a way how to blend the core curriculum and those emerging technologies? That's that's a problem which uh, which we are we are looking into. So, so 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 go back X years and the iPad reared its head and half the schools in the United States say they're going to adopt that or whatever and and some do and some don't and then you end up with classrooms that are and classrooms that aren't and you know there's this whole question of. Of, of can you achieve ubiquity with any technology? Really, can you can you scale within what is a fundamentally fractured system? So, just like, what's your take on on that? Well, it's it's much easier to scale an education if you're doing hand-me-down devices. So, relatively few families are going to buy something fancy for education, but a lot of families, including families in poverty, will buy something powerful in terms of entertainment, or they'll buy something powerful in terms of communication, because communication can be a very important thing within families, particularly at risk families. So the opportunity is to take things that people are going to have anyway for entertainment, for communication, for other parts of their lives, and repurpose them yes. into powerful things for education. and. There always will be some degree of digital divide, both in access and in the kind of content that you can get through even when you have access. Is it really tailored for you? Is it in your language? Is it set up in the way that you need to learn? But mobile devices, handheld devices, immersive devices driven by the entertainment market are going to narrow that digital divide. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I I think the whole discussion is just like starting at wrong end. I think it should start with so what are the jobs we want kids to be prepared for? Uh, then it's what what kind of curriculum we need to have in order to prepare them for the new jobs. Then how we will prepare the teachers to deliver the new curriculum. And I, I think then in kind of like in the second half of the whole discussion is about the tools itself and technology. So. And that's kind of like what we see not only in the U.S. but all around the world, where usually the policymakers they they like to cut the, you know, the new uh, like so fancy schools, and it's, it's good pictures for the for the magazines, and it it really helps with uh, with uh, with their numbers, which is great. But uh, usually those who can uh, who can really think about the whole process from the high level perspective, they don't have really much voice in that. Uh, and then what what is really happening is that you you end up with uh, really classrooms full of devices teachers who are not trained, teacher which usually could not afford iPad for his own house, you know, they, they could not afford to buy the iPad, then uh, you don't have any content for that, they're just saying this is iPad, this is great, there is a lot of free apps, so just, just, just do it, you know, and then you will end up with one of the biggest uh, history of technology uh, in, in the education like LA Unified a couple of years ago. And if I can just build on that, teachers and, and not just teachers, but all the educators in kids' lives, families and informal educators in museums and libraries and mentors in the community. 
those are the most important things. When, when we talk about learning technologies, we're not talking about artificial intelligence and putting teachers in boxes. We're talking about not AI, but IA, intelligence amplification, where we're giving people tools that make them more effective. And the biggest thing about teacher professional development for situated learning and using immersive media is teachers teach as they're taught. If you give somebody an hour lecture on the importance of learning by doing, what are they going to remember? They're going to remember that you lectured at them for an hour. That's what they're going to remember. The medium and the message have to be consistent. If teachers want to learn how to use social media effectively in teaching, they better be learning that by using social media. If teachers are going to learn VR, AR, gaming, immersion, they better be learning it by doing those kinds of activities. And so a big shortfall now is that we're appropriately focusing on kids and learning or adults and learning, but we also need to focus on who those mentors are going to be. Thank you. I, I loved, uh, under what you said about sort of beginning with the, the outcome in mind. Um, it's not something that the education system is particularly great at. Uh, so absent uh, that, that uh, appetite to, to do that, what do, you, what do you guys think is the sort of way to begin to get adoption? Like, how do you get the curb going up around this uh, around this impactful technology. So, so um, based on my numbers, there is like two to three percent of teachers around the world who loves teaching. And uh, uh, this is like these early adapters. And, you know, this is the bell curve, obviously. And, you know, those are the guys who, who really like are ready to try the new things. They, 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 they will really do everything that will help to their kids. They are so passionate about their kids and their results. Because as you remember, it's all about sparkling the light bulb moment and, uh, and creating the lifelong learning passion. That's, that's, that's their thing. And uh, if you want to start with adapting the new technology in a classroom, you want to work with those guys. And anyway, it happens today. So uh, if you if look into every single school, there, there is usually at least one. Uh, usually there is uh, uh, there is uh, you know uh, one teacher in district which is doing all of the interesting innovative things, and those are the folks who, who can easily assess if you have an interesting idea or, or product or anything you are trying to bring to the classroom. Those are the guys who can give you the feedback and they can potentially do do, do the school pilot, which usually lasts forever. So if you are doing that tech, yeah, it's a long cycle. <laughs> well, I'm I'm more positive about teachers. I think how many are excited about teaching, how many are good at teaching. It's a very, very difficult profession given all the things that are asked of teachers. But I think that one way to drive this forward is by looking at the kinds of things that students can create when we give them powerful technologies and powerful people to help them understand it. I love to go to community meetings or school board meetings or teacher professional development sessions or PTA meetings and, and show products and say, tell me how old was the student that produced this? What socioeconomic background did they come from? What, what was their grade point average in school before they started on the unit that led to developing this? And watch people be completely wrong and watch people be dazzled by what kids can do that's so far beyond not just what we might expect of kids who are our typical kids in school, but even beyond what we would expect for kids who are terrific in school. And I think in the future, we'll be seen as having lived through kind of a dark ages where we so underestimated yeah. human potential in, in people of every age because we were teaching them in a way that they didn't learn and without the kinds of powerful tools that are becoming available. So I think a big driver forward is for parents or taxpayers or policymakers to see artifacts from kids and to say, wow, a second grader can do that, uh, a middle schooler can do that, a high schooler can do that, and, and they have the same background as, as my kid. I want my kid to have that. I want my community's kids to have that. That's going to be the driver. So last question, which is a little wonky, but um, I have to ask it. Is there, is there anything that's been learned 
in the t development of the t AR VR technology with the education space that is sort of f so fundamental it could should apply to to teaching or learning in general? In other words, has it taught us how to teach better outside of the technology itself? If that makes any sense? I think one of the big promises of, of immersive learning is transfer. Um, one of the things we know is that doing well in school does not necessarily mean you do well in life. And doing poorly in school does not necessarily mean that you do poorly in life. School is largely preparation for more school, as you were saying <laughs> earlier. Not so much preparation for life. And I think that what immersive technologies can help with is transfer. That our kids in a digital ecosystem know a lot more about ecosystems that they bring to the real world than they would if they were only interacting with textbooks and terrariums and things that are not so similar to the real world. And our kids doing augmented reality where they're in the real world with a mobile device that helps them get even better opportunities for transfer because it's a shorter leap. So I think that we're learning a lot about how to make transfer more effective in a continuum that stretches from the blackboard and the textbook all the way through to the augmented reality. Great. So I am visual learner. Uh, is, is anybody in the room who feels like visual learner? Just raise a, raise a hand, please. Yeah, that's, that's about right. So I, I, I think that most the, the majority of people consider themselves as, as a visual learner. And that's what I think where the immersive technologies like all of those words we used before are super helpful because we are just starting to use the brain like much more effectively. We are starting to use this GPU as was designed for this VR, if it makes sense. So uh, uh, that's, that's what, what I learned from the using those technologies in, in the education. It's just somehow like it, it, it finally the information flow much more seamlessly. I, I got the information much more quickly. You know, just reading the text is so boring. I don't kind of care anymore. So uh, that's pretty much what, uh, what 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 Chris said in in, in other words. So. so you know, the other night, um, how many of you watched the debate the other night? So I thought what was uh, it was interesting, a couple hours of my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought one of the most interesting and maybe alarming things was that the word education wasn't mentioned by either of them. And I think to myself, you know, or I thought to my at the time, I think it's it's the lever. It's it's arguably the only lever we have to fix many, if not all, of the problems. And and neither of these people are mentioning this word. And so I, I think the context of the day, the conversation, uh, what's happening in this technology is, is is for me is hopeful, like that maybe we can actually make this thing work better, so that the rest of the world can work better. And I just like to thank you both for your time today. Thank you.